Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Guy Dawson Show at the World Center of Broadcast Media, WCOBM.com. My name is Guy Dawson, and I am the managing member of Classy Communications, a full-service media and marketing company. And if you would like to bring greater recognition to your business, your organization, or yourself personally, please get in contact with us at 702-845-6129 or visit our website, ClassyCommunications.net. As always, we are broadcasting to you live from the Gene Woods Racing Experience in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. I got double high jack. Right. Sheila, have you been watching this? She knew instinctively. Uh, she knew instinctively that she needed to steal my introduction. That's I mean, uh, right. The queen of all media, Corintha, <laughs> is uh, Turvalon is back. And yes. What have you been up to, Corintha? Uh, I'm really happy to be done with finals. Woo! Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so I've been having a little bit of fun. Uh, but then I'm also uh, gearing up and doing some fundraising and uh, working with my with the organization Families United for Justice. We're getting ready for our Detroit conference uh, June 15th and a big event that we, we had a, ho a show about earlier. So yeah, so we're getting ready for that. Well, congratulations. Corintha's been working very hard this semester and yeah. spent a lot of time in this studio going to school at the same time. And boy, it was some kind of a, kind of a year for you, huh? 4.0 GPA. Hey! Oh, wow. We only have the rock stars as a yeah. part of the guy Dawson show. I don't even know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> like, I really don't. <laughs> I can't even say it's due to my intelligence or, you know, because I am not that hard jerk. work. Yeah. It is hard work. It is hard work. By the way, I have my first relative ever on the Guy Dawson <gasps> show. Hi, everyone. Yes. Miss it's Sheila nice to be here. Bradford slash Blanton. Correct. Yes. And she is my cousin's ex-wife. Yeah. And that just shows you you can get along with your family. Absolutely. Once You're still a member family. of the family, exactly. always, always a member of the family. Always, yeah. always family. And uh, yeah. Sheila is the owner of Lonnie M. Designs. It is a custom furniture company uh, based in, well, I guess Los Angeles as yeah. well as Las Vegas. Yes, based in both areas, correct. And so obviously I have known Sheila for a very long time and uh, she had a career that she was into before she got into custom design that yes. kind of launched you. Yes, it was fashion design and merchandising. That's what my degree is. That's what I went to school for really. And I was in fashion for 21 years and selling to all of your major retailers, Bloomingdale's, Nordstrom's, Dillard's, um, for all that time. But I started in the fashion business and parlayed into the furniture business right now. And Sheila, around our family, she was known as the person that's literally traveled the world. Yes. In in become being a fashion consultant and what that must have been quite a ride. Yes. Um. You know, being in fashion, you're going to into China, into India. You're traveling into New York every market, which is every three months. So you're, you're doing a lot of traveling in order to produce a product and compete in the marketplace. Yeah. yeah. Lots of fun, though. And you always hear about people wanting to be in fashion. And Corintha, we were talking about this a few minutes ago, uh, right before we came on the air. It's not necessarily as easy as it's, as it's crack, cracked up to be. Absolutely not. It, that's why when I have people that come to me and say, oh, I want to go into fashion, and I go, okay, that's good. So what type of budget do you have? And what is your market that you're going to target? Those are really important things to know before you go into fashion because to create a collection for a season is gonna cost you, back then it was costing us 100,000, so I can imagine what it costs now. It's probably triple that, probably 500,000. And you just get to show that line to the buyer for the first time if you have sales reps that are calling the major buyers and they come in and look at your line and they don't even write it. They're just going to see if you're going to be there for the first probably three or four seasons. You get no business. So you have that kind of a capital outlay yes. and maybe 
but you're saying probably you won't get any business no, the first won't. couple of seasons that you're exposing your line to people. No, but it might have changed um, now because you can go into social media. You don't really need to rely on the retail buyers to say whether your line is good or not. You can put it out real time to your, your market if you have a good social media presence and start doing business, but you have to produce it. That's another thing. Having the money to produce that. Once you get those orders, can you produce it? You know, and know, then knowing your capacity, knowing your production people, knowing that everything is lined up before you even present it to the marketplace. Because if it's not, you take orders and you can't produce, that'll kill your business. Hmm. We were talking, too, about a um, couple of things. Uh, one thing that I think is interesting is that people don't realize there's there's such a thing that's called retail math. Yes. And what does that involve? Because, you know, there's this perception that when you go into fashion that, you know, that you don't have to be smart or that, you know, there's no intelligence about it. But there really is. Oh, yeah. You know, you definitely need to understand retail math, but you also have to do a cost benefit analysis or a cost sheet on every single item that you produce. You need to know what your thread, I mean your bags, your boxes, your hangers, the fabric, the buttons, the, everything needs to go on that cost sheet. That brings you down to the bottom line of what it's really costing you pr to produce a garment per dozen. You got to do it. You can't just randomly do a garment and you don't know what your fabric costs are. And if you went direct to buy fabric, you're going to pay a different price than you are if you go to a little fabric store. You're going to pay t retail. Everything in the fashion business is wholesale. So you have to know what it's going to cost you, bottom line, because you're going to lose money. You know what shipping is going to cost you, what your boxes, what your hangers, what your buttons, what your zippers, what your pell on, everything that goes into a garment. And most people don't even think about that. Like I look at guy's shirt and this right here, it has Pellon in it. There's Pellon right there. That costs you. Those buttons, they cost you. That stitch right there, that costs you. <laughs> so it just, you have to know what you're doing. And it's really, um, I my thing is I would suggest that you surround yourself with people that know. Don't get your family members, don't get your best friend, somebody that really can give you the knowledge of what it entails to have that business. Mm -hmm. hmm. Why fashion? Why did you choose to get into that? Um, because fashion, I knew in the fourth grade what I wanted to do. I just didn't know how I was going to, what was going to be my role that I was going to travel to get there, but I knew instinctively what I was going to do, what my gift was. I tapped into the gift. Everyone gets a gift. God gives us all one gift. You gotta tap it. Yeah. And not be afraid to tap it. And then that gift will reward you in the long run because it's something that was given to you in order for you to really survive on. And, and a lot of people, they know their gift, but they're afraid to tap that gift so they go get a job because that's comfortable for them. Yeah, we were talking about that on actually on the show last week. We were Corintha was interviewing me, and I was talking about how most people are not doing the thing that they really were meant to do. Mm -hmm. I agree with you absolutely that we were all meant to do something, and it's just a shame that ninety five percent of the people in the world are probably not doing the thing that they should be doing. And if you get a chance and you figure out what it is that you truly are meant to do, you have got to do it. You yes. are blessed. You are a blessed person yes. if you ever figure that out. Yeah. If you figure that out and if you really just say okay I'm just gonna step out on faith I'm gonna follow this it's just so rewarding and you want it God never fails you that's all I can say he, he'll lead you and guide you all your directions I that's why I'm here in the business that I am now because I follow and I listen I listen to what's being said to me. It's like, okay, no, no, don't make that move. Oh, no, yeah, go do this, go do that. And I go, okay. I know fashion is a very competitive industry, and I know that you've been doing big things in the big city, Beverly Hills, L.A., 
how is it different doing business, and we're going to get into your other business a little bit later on mm -hmm. in the interview, but how different is it doing business uh, in fashion uh, as compared to what you're, you're currently doing? I know there's a lot of similarities yeah. in the two. Well, uh, right now doing furniture, it's a slower pace. In fashion, your head is on a swivel all the time because you have to keep your eyes and ears to the grind of what's going on, what's the new trend, what can I make a trend, what, how can I set myself apart from what everyone else is doing. And um, in furniture, furniture lasts longer than fashion. Fashion only lasts every three months. You're doing something new every three months. You better have something new every three months because <laughs> if you don't, they're going to fire you. If your line goes to market and it doesn't sell, that company will fire you. So that's why you just have to know exactly what you're doing and be competitive in every aspect that you can be <laughs> and surround yourself around the right people. That's the most important thing to help you get where you go, reach your goal. Because if you don't, you're not going to last. It's just like if you go, if you look at uh, in the music industry, look at all the legends that have last. You know, you look at um, Gladys Knight, all of those. Those guys are legends, and then you get all these people coming up now, and they're here one day and they're gone the next because they really were not in it for the right thing. Back then. They just wanted some quick fame or something. Right, they weren't really true to their craft. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, whatever it is that you're doing, if you're true to your craft, I think those are the people who, who tend to last uh, any journalism or any industry. It's the ones that you can just tell. It's more than just, like you said, it, you could have a motivation to crank out a hit song, one hit mm -hmm. song, and be a one hit wonder. Nothing wrong with that. You can make a lot of money out there. If there's a one hit wonder, I'm your publicist, by the way. Out there. <laughs> So I am not condemning people who are one-hit wonders. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made, and it's still a success even to do that. Yeah. But you're you're talking about success on a on a deeper longevity. level yes. and having longevity, being um, someone who is around and leaves a legacy on their in their industry. Yes. Yes. And it's um, it's it's difficult. That's a difficult thing to do when you're. Um, starting a company. I work with companies and I learned every aspect of their company before I branched off and did my own. So, you know, you know how people get jobs and they say, oh, this is my job and that's what I'm going to do? Not me. I took my lunch and instead of me taking lunch, I would go and find out how do they do marking and grading? How do you mark and grade a pattern? And how do you order quantity for a large order and how do you order fabric and what are my production pattern makers doing and my first pattern maker. I learned every aspect of it. I know how to do every aspect of that business. So if, if I wanted to go back into it, I can do it tomorrow because I know what to do. I, I can tell if my my cutter is stealing my fabric and selling it out the back door. You know, I can tell if they're squeezing on the marker to make the item smaller than what it's supposed to be. I can tell if they order too many buttons. I can just tell everything. I know every aspect of that business and that's what brought me to the business that I'm in now. It's because I knew what was going on. I couldn't be where I am without knowing those because people steal from me. <laughs> it's, it's almost, I mean, because we talked about how hard the business was earlier just in terms of like, you know, having a really thick skin, but that's a whole other side of it that yeah. you're talking about where, you know, there's this whole ability for people to basically scam you or con you and you have to be ready and know the knowledge to basically not let them do that to you. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a really powerful skill and I think that not enough business owners have that skill. Yeah, or, or either they do know it but then their business grew and they lost touch because they just let other people do it and they really didn't learn for themselves. But I'm more of a hands-on person. I want to know 
what's going on in my business. Because the front end of the business is to get in front of the, the buyer, have a finished product and show it, but the back end of the business is where you lose money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the back end of the business is really where 90% of the work is, is, is done, and that's the reason why there's so few people who I think really stay in business, because they have a perception when they get in business that it's like TV. You see businesses on TV, and they're sitting around, everybody's got a drink, and they're <laughs> cutting these million dollar business deals. <laughs> You know, you yeah. and I have talked about right. this, it and looks, yeah. when you're running a business, most of the time you're sitting in f behind a computer yeah. <laughs> for hours mm -hmm. by yourself. Mm -hmm. yes. That's where most of my business is done, and we, an hour a week, Corinth and I get to get in front of the camera and, and laugh and have a good time, but the, the hours that go into it behind the scenes, is uh, that's yeah. truly what your business is. Oh, yeah, you're up wee hours of the night to make that happen so that you can be prepared for the next day, yes. But now I think um, the fashion business has changed a lot because of e-commerce. E-commerce has changed a lot of business. Mm -hmm. And um, whereas be when I was in the business, you relied on the buyer to buy from you. Now you can go real time with the consumer. That's the best thing about it. E-commerce is a phenomenal thing. And that's how I build my business now, is e-commerce, the furniture business. But um, the fashion business, I relied on other people to say whether my line was great or if it was going to fit into their their floor plan for the, the month or the, the season, and, you know. And then buyers, they made a mistake because they put everybody in the same, you know, well, this is what we're giving the consumer now. And that's all you're going to get. And uh, there's a lot of different, we're all different individuals. We like different things, you know? Okay, so if they say the color palette for, the merchandisers say the color palette for the, this season's are going to be um, jewel tones. Every buyer, every store is coming in looking for jewel tones. What about the customer that wants pastels or natural colors? What about them? So that's where I think they lost it and e-commerce took over. And you see now a lot of retail stores are going out of business because of that. Yeah. And the buyers, they were prima donnas, man. <laughs> yeah, because they, they had it, right? <laughs> they were prima when, donnas. When you have it, then you ba they're basically dictating your career to yes. you, your income. Yes. I mean, when they have a, uh, the ability and the power to come into you and give you a order for 3,600 pieces on just one top or give you an order that's two, three hundred thousand dollars, they were queens and kings and queens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they dictated what was going on in the marketplace and what the consumer liked. Like I... <laughs> I look in the furniture business and I see everything in the stores at one time was brown. Because that's what the buyer said the consumer wanted. <laughs> brown. <laughs> you know, everybody wants brown. Everything's going to be brown. And I look now and you go to homes because I do interior design as well. And everything is brown. The walls are brown, the furniture's brown, the carpet's brown, the accessories are brown. And I go, ooh, how depressing. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me depressed. I just want to go in and just, okay, let's get rid of everything and let's start over now. But you know, you have to work with, within people's budgets. But yeah, everything was brown. Wow. And, and I see that in people in Vegas haven't caught on to the fact that everything isn't brown. Mm -hmm. But in L.A., when I go home to L.A., you know, they're more forward. Mm -hmm. In Vegas, I go into people's house and I go, brown? Well, we haven't done brown in L.A. for the last 10 years. <laughs> It just surprises me, and they, and they everybody thinks that that's fabulous. 
Oh, okay. mm. Well, that creates a niche, and Sheila is doing a lot of business in Vegas. We're going to take a commercial break, and when we come back, I want to talk about how you introduced a lot of the color that you see out there. Mm -hmm. uh, it was introduced by Sheila Blanton, and you know, I want you to talk about how you made the transition from the fashion industry into the custom furniture industry. I've been working with Sheila on some projects, just phenomenal pieces, and she's got <clears throat> exhibits down in, uh, in very famous show places in both California and uh, Nevada and I'm, it's really a privilege to interview Sheila Blanton. She is my, uh, my relative and, yes. uh, and we're working together on some projects. We'll take a short commercial break and be back with more of The Guy Dawson Show.